Hey there, I'd like to talk about some goodies that Unity has given us, which makes working with async workflows much more attractive. It also removes a bunch of the primary concerns that people had using async workflows. If you're watching this, I'm going to assume that you've already seen part one of this series. If you haven't, go and watch it. Or if you're already pretty confident with async, just continue watching this one. So if you've used tasks in Unity before, you may have noticed that tasks, specifically task.delay, runs in real world time and not in game time. So if you were to change your time scale to maybe zero to completely stop it, you'll notice that your task and your async function will just continue to run like nothing happened, which is one of the problems that Unity has solved with the new awaitable class. This is a Unity variant of the C Sharp task class, and it gives us Unity functionality. By the end of this video, you'll be very comfortable using it. So let's jump into the first test. In start, I start a task loop and an awaitable loop. The only difference between these is that this one is uh, using task delay, and this one is using the new awaitable wait for seconds. So this takes in a float as convention in Unity, and this will actually run on game time. So if we press play here, we'll see that both the task and awaitable start pending. And if we press the stop time button here, you'll see the task continues to run, but awaitable has been paused. Then we can resume time and the awaitable will continue where it was left off. So obviously this is much nicer to use in Unity than the previous task delay. In addition to the wait for seconds async, we've also got next frame async, which would be the equivalent of the coroutine yield return null. We've got end of frame async and we can wait for the next fixed update. Now, when I press stop on this test, we will experience the main concern that people have when using async workflows in Unity. And that is that the tasks will just continue to run. Whereas a coroutine will clean itself up when the object is destroyed or the application stops, tasks will just continue to run. Unity has given us a very elegant way to handle this, but let me show you what workflow might look like currently. Now, I know I didn't touch cancellation tokens in my previous video. If you're unaware of what they are, basically it gives us a way to cancel long running operations. So for example, if a player in your game clicks uh, a button which uh, is quite intensive or it takes a while, let's say they want to load all the 2v2 lobbies. If they then decide that they know they don't want 2v2 lobbies, they want 3v3 lobbies, you can now trigger the cancellation token for the 2v2 lobbies that will stop that operation. You can create a new cancellation token for 3v3 lobbies and then continue from there. It just gives us an easy way to get out of an operation. So your workflow might look a little bit something like this. Previously, you create your token, we start our long running task. In our on destroy function, we are canceling the token and disposing it. And then in our long running task, each iteration, we're just checking to see if it's been canceled and if so, stop the loop. Now it's a good time to note here that uh, now that awaitable is here, you really should never be using task.delay. Maybe if you're doing some uh, non runtime things like in the editor and you've got like a, you need to do things with like real life timers. Uh, but honestly, any runtime now, you should be using awaitable. Anyway, so we're sending the token in and if it actually gets canceled while this is happening, this will throw and then we'll be able to handle it gracefully here. So let's see how that looks. We'll see that it's running our long running task here. And if we destroy this object, the destroy token was canceled. So now let me show you how we handle it in Unity 2023. We do not need this token here. We don't need to send in this token. We don't need to clean anything up in destroy and we don't need to take this. Now, if we decompile mono behavior, we'll see up the top here that it now has a destroy cancellation token. Uh, we're just given this by default now and we can actually do it right here. Uh, static method, it's a member method. So destroy cancellation token is cancellation requested. And then in here, we can just send straight in the destroy cancellation token. And now this will work exactly the same, but without all that extra boilerplate. So now this will be cleaned up just as if you were using a coroutine, for example. And just to prove it, we can destroy it. And there we go. It is worth noting that if you're returning a void here, uh, this will not actually catch and you will actually get an exception error in your face. Uh, so ensure that you're always returning a task uh, or actually an awaitable. You can return a waitable instead of a task. I've actually got a little bit to say on that a little bit later, so just wait up. So along with our destroy token, we've also got an application level token. So application exit cancellation token, and this, this really is editor specific. So uh, now we'll have our long running task, and when we press stop, it will exit token was canceled. And uh, as you can imagine, on destroy is also called when you stop the flow. So this will also work uh, for editor stopping as well. All right, so this next feature I'm incredibly excited about. I'm calling it thread swapping. I don't know if there's an official name. Uh, effectively, what it lets us do is 
move back and forth between the main thread and a background thread with ease. So let me show you how that works. So I've got this infinite loop here. And first thing I'm doing is moving to the background thread. So as soon as we call this, everything that follows will happen in a background thread. Depending on if I have this Boolean checked, I'm doing the computation in the background thread or I'm doing it in the main thread. As you can see, I'm calling the main thread to go back to the main thread. Now that we're on the main thread, I can then access my UI elements. So obviously you can only manipulate UI elements on the main thread. So for example, if I was to put this up here on the background thread, uh, it would throw an error saying that I cannot access that. And this compute total is just like purposely a long running operation. So let me show you how this looks with uh, background threading off. As you can see, it's really chugging along because it's trying to do everything on the main thread. As soon as we click use background thread, we'll see that it is as smooth as butter. And it looks quite pretty too. But yeah, such an elegant workflow, uh, perfect for singular threaded long running processes. I say singular threaded because if you think the, the computational task can be multi-threaded, then you'll probably go for jobs or something like that. So this could be perfect for something like an API call or say you've got an algorithm that's all pretty lightweight, but there's one line that's a little bit computational heavy. You could just sandwich it between these two lines and have it run in the background and then just continue the workflow with absolute ease. Obviously, if you did that, then your function may not actually finish on the same frame. So you need to be careful about that. All right, this next one, I just wanted to touch on the fact that you can return a waitable instead of task, but I actually have not found a reason to do so. And in fact, I've, I've only found negatives. So if we were to re return an awaitable here, we wouldn't be able to use functions like task when all, for example, as that is expecting a task. I have actually asked my Unity rep CalDaddy to track this down and, and ask the awaitable team if there is any reason to return an awaitable. Hopefully I can put his answer up on the screen on an annotation. And just while we're here, if you've never actually seen task.when all, it's just a way to wait for a whole bunch of tasks that you've got running. As you can see, I've got three tasks here. They all return some data and I'm awaiting them all. And then at the end, I actually sum up all the data. So let's see how that looks. Beautiful. Now we do actually have another function available to us, which is wait all, but this is synchronous. You cannot await it. And uh, also you should never use it in Unity either uh, because it will just freeze your game completely. All right, this next one's exciting. If you were to ask somebody why they don't use an async workflow, it's probably one of two reasons. One, that tasks uh, continue to run when an object dies or the editor's stopped, which I've shown you that we've fixed with a waitable. Or second, that it doesn't work in WebGL. Specifically, task delay does not work in WebGL. And you'll be happy to know that a waitable has solved this problem. So if we press play, we'll see that in the editor, everything on both of them is working just fine. But if we go across to a WebGL build, we'll see that just the awaitable is working. If you use task delay anywhere in your build in WebGL, you'll notice that it just does not work. So that should have a few people half chubbed. And this last one is quite boring, but I figured I would still uh, mention it. All the Unity functions that return an async operation, for example, the scene manager does it, uh, some resource functions do it. Awaitable has now given us a helper function to return an awaitable from it, and we can just await it just like any normal task. Uh, so let's do that. Pretty boring demo, but there we go. And that is everything I wanted to show. Hopefully that was enough to push you into using async workflows. And if you're already using a tool like Unitask, maybe this was enough to get you to just start using uh, the native awaitable. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and concerns, write them down below in the comments, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.